Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chad Cummings. I work for JKB Energy. We are a turnkey solar integrator uh, based in the Central Valley of California. Uh, I'll be giving uh, another overview of where the solar industry is at, spending a little more specific time on how solar systems provide a positive cash flow, and actually looking at, at really the mechanism of net energy metering, uh, which is California's solar policy, and even seeing on a month-to-month -month basis how that cash flow ebbs and flows to ultimately provide the annual savings uh, that you would expect from your solar system. And then I'll wrap up uh, the presentation on giving a, a basic overview of uh, the coming changes to the solar policy within California. So for a basic outline, I'll, I'll give a general update on where payback rates are for solar systems. Uh, I'll go through the details of uh, how solar provides a positive cash flow, um, even in the first year. And then, uh, of course, outline what we know uh, about the changes coming to uh, California's solar policy in the next 12 months. There's a lot of things we don't know, but there's a few things we can uh, safely start, um, I guess, working under certain expectations of changes. So I'll outline that. Some of that revolves around the federal investment tax credit, uh, but a lot of it revolves around what we're calling net metering three which has not been implemented or really determined yet, uh, but we are uh, starting to see some direction that the proceedings um, may take over the coming year. And then finally, I'll wrap up with um, all of my contact info as well um, and some uh, ways to stay updated on these changes throughout the year. So for a basic overview of solar, um, a solar paybacks, essentially solar as an investment, uh, we are seeing continued uh, improvements in paybacks or an increasing rate of return across all systems. Some of this, uh, some of the driving factor is, of course, some reduced installation costs. We're still finding new ways to reduce uh, the overall um, cost of the system. What what would be the total out of pocket for the consumer? Some of that's coming from. Uh, pricing reductions in the solar panel market, uh, the inverter market, but racking and uh, overall system designs are becoming more streamlined and the more we can uh, design these and build these more efficiently with less materials um, or just building them smarter overall, I guess you could say, that helps uh, bring some economies of scale to the market. But the primary driver of these improved returns on investment are the increasing utility rates, uh, particularly in uh, the PG&E market. In this past year, ag rates for PG&E have gone up 8 to 10%, and they're scheduled to do the same in 2021. So with solar, when you have rate increases, the, the generation or the, the solar output that you're actually generating your own energy on site to be used by your, your pump, or by a, a manufacturing facility or a processor, holder, whatever would be your electric load, uh, you're generating your own power. And when you don't need that power, you get to sell it back to PG&E. So those rate increases are, um, the majority of the rate increase is, is being um, shielded from you by your solar system. So in general terms, what do you expect from a solar system? What's the, the value it brings? What's the value proposition? And particularly, how does it provide you the savings that you, you, uh, you hear about all the time, whether it's from a solar proposal or in the news or ads on TV, online? Um, what is solar doing for you? Well, it's, it's doing two main things. It's producing your own energy that gets used on site by pumps, processors, holers, uh, whatever you have it. And when you don't need the energy, if you're, if you're producing energy, whether it's on a weekend or particularly probably winter months would be more applicable to uh, the audience today, uh, you're going to use more energy in the summer than you would winter. What happens to your excess energy in the wintertime? Well, you get to sell it back to your utility provider at essentially the retail value. You get to sell it back at the same price as you would have to buy it. And those that surplus of energy gets built up on your utility account as a credit to be used later on in the year. So I'm going to use two terms quite a bit today, and, and I'll give a very simple definition of each, but I'll be using the term net energy consumer and net energy exporter uh, for the discussion on cash flows. So a net energy consumer is someone who, as it 
is somewhat self-explanatory. You're using more energy during a month than you would be producing from your solar system. So you're a net consumer of energy. You still have to buy energy from you, your utility provider over and above what your solar system has provided already. And a net energy exporter would be the essentially the opposite or the inverse of that. You generate more energy over the course of a month than you ended up using. So you have an excess amount you get to sell back to the utility provider. Um, either way, or in any given month, you have to pay whatever your net charges would be um, over and above uh, your demand charges. So demand charges, just plan on paying them every month solar just plan on solar not helping that at all but regarding your energy charges if you're a net consumer and so you still had to buy energy from pg e that month you still have to pay that bill in that month you don't get to defer it uh, to the end of the year at one time earlier on in the solar program they would let you defer payments that that hasn't been the case for quite a while, but I still get questions on that. Uh, when you're a net energy exporter in a month and you've banked surplus generation or surplus solar output, put it back in the grid, gotten your credit, that goes on to your account. And if you have multiple months in a row where you're a net energy exporter, well, then uh, you would be building up a bigger and bigger surplus. You get to carry that forward or roll it over and save it for the months when you start running the higher utility bills. Then you can start drawing on that surplus, and uh, that's really the key mechanism for how these cash flows works. So with that said, it's probably easier to look or see this uh, concept demonstrated rather than continue uh, to just go over definitions. So... Uh, I've already kind of given the summary, I guess. You essentially generate your credits during your non-usage season. And for today's presentation, I'm going to use a, a pump, an irrigation pump, as my example. So obviously the winter month will be uh, the time period during the year you're generating solar credits. And during the summer is when you're running high utility bills. That's when you want to have a surplus of credits going into the summer to be able to draw on that and offset those high utility charges. Um, and of course, any month your electric load or your equipment or pump is used, uh, you should expect to have a demand charge because essentially any time or any month you turn that on, even if it's for one 15-minute period, you will have a demand charge. So this would be the cash flow before solar. Uh, for a, a typical pump, uh, let's say two or 300 horsepower, that's getting used pre pretty heavily in the summer. Um, I'm assuming from November to March, it really doesn't get used at all, but in April through October, it is when it's primarily being used. So the orange bars represent your demand charge, which is more or less the same each month. I'm assuming that pump gets used um, or when it's ran, it's ran pretty much full throttle, and so you're going to generate a high demand reading any given month it's turned on. But then you can see that the blue lines um, go up and then come down again. That's going to be indicative or, or really be an example of the run time. The longer you run that pump, the more energy charges that energy portion of your bill is going to be. So blue is energy charges, orange is demand. So the blue is what we're trying to uh, reduce or eliminate with solar, and the orange is um, the demand, which we really uh, can't do much about uh, for the purpose of this talk. So this would be what your solar uh, cash flow would look like in roughly the first year of your system. And the year one versus uh, year two and subsequent years actually look a little different. And that's what I want to draw some attention to today, uh, just based on the feedback I've gotten from um, quite a few individuals. So for the sake of uh, this illustration, let's assume that your true up period is, um, is in... Uh, between July and August. So August 1st, that system came online. You can see that in this month, the blue, uh, the blue um, energy charges is significantly lower. That would be the system still producing um, a lot of energy on site, but not enough energy to offset all of your energy charges. So you're a net consumer, so you still have a net bill due to PG&E. So you pay your demand charges, and then you pay your energy charges on top of that. Come September, the blue line is, is even higher. And this is where uh, it might seem a little counterintuitive. You're thinking, I have solar. Why are my 
my why has my monthly energy charges gone up? Well, a solar system's production, if you were to chart it out, it's going to look something kind of like a bell curve. You're going to have your highest generation in the summer months, and as the days get shorter and shorter as we head into fall and winter, those days get obviously shorter, so there's less solar exposure, sun exposure on your panels, so your output goes down, but you're still running this pump, um, in, this, in this example at least, you're still running this pump uh, a lot of hours. So you actually have a higher net consumption here. You're still using uh, more energy than you've produced, and you've actually produced a little less energy this month than the month prior, so you end up with a bigger bill. And it's not until October when you essentially uh, finally stop using that pump that that system generates more than enough energy than whatever you consumed on site. So now you've transitioned in this month from September to October to a net exporter, that, that term I was using. You've put more back into the grid than you've pulled out. So now you have a negative bill. Anything below this, this line here is going to be a, uh, a credit surplus on your PG&E account. Anything above are going to be bills you have due. So as you can see, as you move into the winter and you're not using that pump, you start building up a bigger and bigger credit and it goes farther and farther and farther until you come into your, uh, your summer uh, irrigation period and then that line uh, continues to build up. This is reflective of, again, that, that solar production curve. Um, but in June, you start to see the the credit start being eaten away because your your usage now has continued to increase to the point where you've uh, then gotten rid of all of the surplus of credits and you're you're back to the start. So um, this would be again for a July to August true up period. Now where it gets better is in year two. So it takes really about a full year for the cash flow to kind of balance out and for your energy credits from your solar system to, to really catch up. And I guess this is kind of the point of going into a cash flow model on a month to month basis. This would have the same true up period, but now starting in year two, where again in August, you can see here, because you've been carrying that surplus forward, versus the, the prior slide, you start here and you have a net charge due to PG&E. In this next month, because you carried forward uh, the, the surplus, you actually don't have a bill due in August. And then in September, you have a small bill due. Uh, forgive me, this is a... Uh, the whole virtual presentation uh, still getting still getting used to it, but you can see here that you have a much smaller, um, much smaller net bill due to PG&E, and and so from year two on, this is what your cash flow essentially will look like. You've you've had the uh, you've had enough time in your non-usage months to build up those surpluses to carry you through your high usage seasons. So that's really really the whole point of looking at the cash flow from year one to year two. And then forward, um, solar really provides a, a, um, a great mechanism for reducing those energy bills. But it does take about a year to really kind of hit your rhythm, so to speak, for that. So uh, if you have an aggregated system as well, where you have multiple meters being offset by a single solar system, um, it works the same way. It's just across all the meters that are combined, and it, it essentially gets more complex if you were to try to chart it out. Um, so hopefully this isn't uh, too much in the weeds, but um, it, it hopefully demonstrates the point that um, you really just have to see that system accumulate its credits. Um, and in both years, even in year one, uh, you end up saving the same amount of money in total. It's just when you, when you save up uh, the credits versus when you're spending them. So to kind of wrap this up, um, your solar anniversary or when that system was initially turned on and approved by your utility provider is what determines that true up time during the year. Um, the first year of your solar operation is really critical to kind of establishing that cash flow. Um, you will save the money that you're projected as long as the system is, is operational and performing as it was projected. Um, and once you hit that second year is usually when you start seeing um, that smooth cash flow coming in and ideally you 
should only be left with really the demand charges left. Um, and again, this applies for aggregated systems, but for simplicity today, just wanted to keep it to a single um, pump example. So uh, with uh, the few minutes I have left, I just want to give a few uh, kind of key points to watch out for and keep in consideration um, for anyone who might be interested in solar. So uh, current paybacks are the best we've ever seen. I'd say on average they're about two to three years, in some cases even um, less than a two-year payback if, um, if kind of all the, the stars align on, on the project, so to speak. Usually larger projects will see um, faster paybacks just due to economies of scale. Um, these return on investments are based on the current solar program, which is net metering 2.0. Uh, that provides a full retail rate for the energy that you produce back in the grid, less any uh, non-bypassable surcharges um, when you net export. Um, that ends up being about two cents a kilowatt hour. It's a pretty negligible amount. So for all intents and purposes, um, you're really getting a great deal under NIM 2.0. Um, you have that annual true up, you have aggregation available for those who want it, uh, and you're, you're getting top dollar for your energy, especially as energy costs continue to increase. So as of right now, we are expecting net metering 2.0 to last through about the end of 21, uh, 2021. So we're anticipating about a year left. That's not a, a hard and final date. It could happen before the end of 2021. It could happen after. I don't know. It's, it's really, there's too many balls in the air right now to be certain. But I'd say in general terms, we have about a year left. Uh, we know that proceedings are starting to pick up between all the parties and entities that get to have their input into what that NIM3 policy will be. Uh, the one thing I can guarantee you is that your savings will not be as high on NIM3 as they will on NIM2. Uh, the utility providers um, are, are going to push for probably a much lower crediting rate based on a lot of variables and um, really just a lot of factors are going to go into this. We might see variations where commercial and agricultural rate classes get a different NIM program than residential rate programs. We don't know it. Really anything's fair game, but as far as what the utilities will be advocating for, it would be uh, less advantageous to solar adopters. Um, we may not have annual trips. They may go to a monthly trip, uh, which would also be a reduction in your annual savings. That would mean you cannot carry forward any unused credits, any surplus of credits month to month you would essentially lose. We have seen some um, smaller utility districts uh, already move to that, so we do know there's precedent for that. Um, another thing that could be on the table is taking meter aggregation away, where then you would have to have one solar system for every meter you would want to benefit from solar. Uh, again, I've seen other smaller utility districts um, move that way as they get to reshuffle their net energy metering policy. So all of these things, um, these are not, uh, th there's precedent for all of these things. We've seen them happen. We just don't know if it will happen with the larger utilities um, or investor owned uh, utilities like PG&E, SCE, and San Diego Gas and Electric. And then there will be some kind of grandfathering policy for anyone who, um, starts a project either now or any time before the net energy metering three policy gets put into effect. There's always been some kind of grandfathering policy, but we don't know exactly what the criteria for that will be. So um, it's better better to start your project early and be be safe rather than sorry. Sometimes it's enough to have just an application in. Sometimes you have to get through um, the, the end of the project basically to have PTO to be grandfathered in on a particular solar um, iteration or solar policy. So this is probably one of the bigger wild cards is what will it take to be locked in to NIM 2.0 and what will the crediting rate be? Those will be the two biggest factors to determining average paybacks on uh, NIM 3. And finally, as a brief industry update on, on project timelines, um, component details, things like that, I just want to give a few um, additional resources. Average project timelines take about 6 to 12 months. Um, this would be for both small and large projects alike. It really is going to depend on the utility provider and the county you're in. Um, 
the construction timeline for projects really is probably the, the shortest period of the entire process. But depending on the project scope, whether or not utility upgrades are needed, that would put you on the longer end. On top of that, think about the time it takes to navigate a proposal process to get the designs right, to get the analysis right, and make sure you have everything sized appropriately. So. That being said, leave yourself more time than not to get your project um, designed out the right way, um, choosing the right integrator to partner with, and then um, going through the, the actual construction process. So uh, given that we expect uh, NIM 2.0 to give us about another 12 months or so of runway, um, I would definitely start sooner rather than later in the proposal process for any new projects. Uh, solar panel sizes have continued to increase quite rapidly. Uh, this time last year, we were looking at pa average panel sizes at about 385 watts per panel. We, we are seeing projections of 435 to 465 watts um, being probably the typical size. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the balance of system costs have continued to decline as we find more streamlined ways to install these uh, systems. And last but not least, we have the investment tax credit that uh, is obviously declining year over year. Through the end of this year, which means you've got about three weeks left or so, you can lock in your tax credit at 26%. That would be 26% of the total project cost you get back in the form of a tax credit in the year in which you finish your project. So obviously any project you start right now is not gonna get finished this year. However, you can lock in this 26% and carry it forward into a future year. In 2021, uh, starting on January, 20, uh, January 1st, the tax credit will be set at 22% for all of next year. And in 2022 and beyond, the tax credit is set for 10% moving forward. So uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the, the safe harboring requirements for the federal investment tax credit, you just have to have 5% of incurred costs in your project uh, with a contract. So you've got to get a contract done this year and essentially put a 5% deposit down if you wanted to lock in at 26%. Next year, you'll have that same opportunity, uh, but it's at 22%. If you lock in at either of these rates, you are safe harbored at whatever rate you lock into through the end of 2023. That means you've got a couple years to finish your project and get it online. If your project does not get finished by December 31st, 2023, uh, it will revert to the 10% mark. The 10% tax credit is essentially set there indefinitely the way the legislation is written. So visit jkbenergy.com for uh, art lots of articles that we have up there. We have a monthly newsletter and we'll be providing regular updates specifically on the NIM uh, 3 transition. So thank you everyone for listening. I hope you found something uh, beneficial and of value in this conference. Of course you can contact me directly. Uh, again, my name is Chad Cummings. Um, I'll put my contact information up here, please feel free to email me or call me um, or visit our website for any um, uh, updates. Again, you can sign up for a newsletter. And of course, if you're interested in a, a solar uh, installation or even just want to see some um, complimentary analysis on what solar could save you on whether it's your pump or any kind of facility or business, please contact me and I'd be happy to work with you. Thank you very much and have a great rest of your conference.